and you, get, you set up the running room, and all of a sudden you've got 15 people walking around the block, and then two weeks later they're running a bit, and three weeks later they're running a bit more, and six months later they're running a 5K, they're talking about you to everybody. But not you, they're talking about how you enable them to do it. How do you become a trigger in their life? How do you get them that they're cut? So many uh, uh, consumers now are on the cusp of wanting to do something else. I want to try yoga. I want to, I want to find out, do something else. How do you help them get there? How do you understand that the consumers looking at is my brands, my media, my contribution, my community? Help me achieve that, I'm loyal to you. Don't help me to achieve that, how inexpensive are you because you're going to be competing on price. Other thing I really find phenomenal is now for the first time ever, they're in control of what they consume. In the past, I went home, I was telling you yesterday, I used to run home at 4 o'clock after school because I wanted to watch Hogan's Heroes. My sister wanted to watch Petticoat Junction, lame show. And, and I, and, but I sat there and I had to watch eight minutes of advertising if I wanted to watch Hogan's Heroes. And I, was, there were, I, and I had to be there at 4 o'clock if I wanted to see it. And if I missed it, I was dead. You see nothing. You see nothing. <laughs> I saw Petticoat Junction. And you can only watch two episodes of that. Confidence to make informed buying decisions. So if you're out in the business now of, like, I'm going to build a deck this weekend. I don't quite know where to go. Am I going to listen to Home Depot or am I going to talk to my three people in my social network that are great do-it-yourselvers and maybe get them to come over and guide me? I'm going to create, for the first time ever, I sat there consuming media my entire life, that, that priest talking about the stained glass window. I, I consume the books. I consume the newspapers. Any propaganda, society's control of journalism and culture, I consumed what they told me to consume. And for the first time ever now, I'm allowed to create and publish. 60% of Gen Y have created original content. Today as we speak, 10,000 hours will be uploaded on YouTube. There'll be more original content put on YouTube in the next six months than NBC, ABC, and CBS since its inception. And not one writer, not one producer, not one creative director, not one Hollywood studio is involved. You got, this is a profound shift in what we're doing. And then the final thing is the community unleashing the army of David. You have a community. Your employees are a community. Your, your listeners are a community, your readers are a community, and these guys are going to unleash and take down Davids if they don't like what you're talking about, and they're going to rally their army if they love what you're talking about, because that's the beauty of humanity. We want to bring together our, our people to a cause. As a business, we've got to be relevant where they surf, and everybody's just focused on that. Oh, I've got to get a website, I've got to get a blog. But you also have to be relevant where they shop, you have to be relevant where they play, you have to be relevant where they live. That's what social marketing is. You have to, the relevancy is where people socialize, online or offline, how do we make our ideas and brands relevant. Here, as I'm talking about to clients, the first thing that they struggle with is they're no longer in control. Every client thinks they're in control of their brand. Every client thinks they're in control of their business. Reality is, you're no longer in control. Consumers are in control. And the best marketers are letting their brand go, and, and, which is the hardest thing in the world because if you talk to a car company and they're launching a car, I'm going to spend a million dollars, it's got to be that winding road ad, often the Big Sur, beautiful sunlight, gorgeous shot, I'm going to get Spike Lee to direct it, little buzz type, professional driver, do not attempt at home, gorgeous ad, magazine ads, the thickest, glossiest stock, that's how I launch a car. It doesn't happen like that anymore. People aren't paying attention to that. They've seen it a thousand times. They want to stick a fork in their eye when they see one of those curvy road ads. I can say that because Don didn't show up. So, <laughs> First thing I tell you to do is, as you're starting to get in this journey, is who is your target? I love, oh, females, 25 to 49. What's that? That's not a target. That's a third of the population, and they're all different. I want you to start dreaming about your brand and your company. Is, so if you're talking about a local radio station, I want you to imagine you're in the kitchen listening or in the car, and, and you're, and you're you, you know, buying a cup of tea, having a beer, trying to understand three things, head, heart, and hands, how they think and going to think, how they feel, what makes their heart beat, and hands, how they buy, what they do for a living, right? How they, how they shop. So often I see clients going, oh, we have the greatest brand equity in the world. I give them the high five, that's great. Now, but why does your sales number say that 70% of your volume is now coming in on deal? Because that consumer that loved you and thought about you walks in the store and becomes a shopper. No, I'm just saying that you're, 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 the, the reality is so many think people hold up their brand equity scores and consumers go, I really like big pens, love big pens. And they go in the store and they go, well, 70% love big pens, but why do I have to put them on sale to sell them? Because they get in the store and they go, a pen's a pen. A shopper is very different than a consumer, is my point. So you've got to really understand how they think, how they feel, and how they behave. You need ideas that are big enough and relevant enough now, 6,500 messages a day, filters, 
that they're magnetic because the first time ever, those ideas are going to be strong enough to pull the consumer in. Because you used to just sledgehammer there. Tony the Tiger tastes great. Tony the Tiger tastes great. Before you know it, women going in the stores like zombies, buying processed corn, powdered sugar, and thinking that's part of the start of a good breakfast. Right? Right? The thing, also, you've got to learn how to ignite your idea now on the web because when it's socialized, you've got to find a way to plant a seed and have the courage to put a little water in sunshine and let it go. And then maybe come back and put it and put it. And then once it really starts going, then you drop uh, uh, the real energy in it. I said, you have to learn how to socialize, facilitate discussions. We have people to do nothing more than get on with our clients' brands, representing their brands. We don't disguise it. And just talk. What did you think? Have you seen that? Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? So we get people talking about our brands. Understand that on the web, as you speak today, I don't care if you're a saint, people are for you or against you. The question is, do you have enough advocates that are so passionate about you that if, if there's somebody attacks your brand, they're defending you? And if you want me to prove the point today, go on any blog you're on and write how much you hate Apple. And you watch how people all over the world will rally and attack you because they love Apple. And that's, the, that's to me, the testament of a good brand. Finally, you've got to learn how to multiply it in an effortless and efficient way because the multiplier effect is amazing. My daughter has, has 860 close friends on Facebook. 860 <laughs> close friends, right? And so if she comes back, and sometimes they try to describe this as an orchestra. So in the past, television was the drums. Boom, 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 loud, overpowering. And then the percussion came in, which was reach out, come on, bye. And that's all you needed. Today, if I can connect with you with a simple flute, just you, nobody else in the audience hears it, and you're so moved, you're going to go home, and all of a sudden, you're going to tell 500 people about that flu. And they're going to suddenly come in and be your army of David. Not only those 500 people, each have 500 people. And next thing you know, this idea is multiplied because of that single note versus yelling out on, on, on TV that's dismissed. And then you've got to procreate the idea. And the interesting thing about procreation is, how do I seduce the, map, the journalists to start writing about this idea? How do I get them engaged in the idea? So let's take a couple of quick case studies. Unilever came to us and said, we want to launch a shampoo in Canada. And that's just what Canada needed was another shampoo. I mean, right? And so we looked at, we, we, we said, who's your target audience? And you know, it was like that, 18 to 27. They said, no, let's, let's pick something. We said, she's 25 years old. The research company came back and said, oh, she's fun. She's, I mean, you please tell me we didn't spend money on that. What, really, let's get into how she's thinking, feeling, behaving. What we found out is that She's going through a quarter-life crisis. Many 25-year-olds, they've denied their age of responsibility. Many of them are kippers. Kids in, in parents' pockets are eroding retirement savings, right? <laughs> so they're, they're staying at home, but she's staying at home, and she's kind of still wanting to party and have fun. And by God, a friend of hers is going to graduate school. Somebody's getting promoted. Somebody's married. Somebody's pregnant. The whole thing is corrupt because they used to feed a perfect society, and now everybody's, so they don't know where they are. So we said, well, there's emotional space because every other part of shampoo has been covered, right? Puffy hair, blonde hair, brown hair. So we, we started talking in the emotional space, and it came out that women hate bad hair days. They hate bad hair days. And I, as you can tell, I've never had a good one, but if, am I true to say that? <laughs> bad hair days, and especially they have stories. Oh, my God. It always happens. I got this lousy hair, and I run into my boyfriend, or I run into my ex-boyfriend or his old girlfriend, and next thing you know, these stories came out. And when they start talking stories, you know you've got insight. You know you've got something inside their heart that's so exciting. So he said, what if we called it wigging out? What if we could say you're wigging out and then we could be the shampoo that now had a purpose in life? We could stop you from wigging out because of that was such emotional. So that's what we did. But we couldn't put in a 30 second act. Can you imagine that? You're wigging out. It's like, oh. So what we did is we put together an enormous budget, $3,000. Took over the Sheridan uh, Four Point Hotel and just rented it because you can rent it by the hour. So we rented it for a couple hours. <laughs> And that's another story. I didn't know that at the time, I swear. Uh, you told me that, actually. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, to my neighborhood. yeah, and uh, we hired some actresses, $200 an hour, and we put together this bride cutting off her hair just before she gets married. And, and what we wanted to do was to say, what a perfect time to have a wig up. Because if you're a woman getting married, there's some things that are very important to you. Does my dress look good? Do my bridesmaids look ugly? Uh, <laughs> Is my hair look great? And I, the last thing I really think about is the, the stiff at the end of the aisle because I got him for the next 25 years. This is my show. So what a time to have a wig up. So we had this little wig up happening here. 